It's great to be here, folks. And uh, always come here is just to reminisce a little bit and think of what God has done. And then, of course, to reminisce even farther back when uh, we met. And a funny thing, I don't know, maybe we told you, uh, Pastor Roger, we were, we had just gotten acquainted, I think, met each other. And then we met you again. And Donna, my wife, said, okay, Raj. She was so embarrassed. She said, I don't know where that came from, Raj. But that's a joke at our house. Um, Many, many years of memories and the good things of God. So we thank God for his grace all these years. Donna would have been with me, but um, this summer, uh, Partyville, just north of Madison, we are making kind of as our our home base, staying with our daughter, Sri, and her husband, Mitch. Uh, Mitch's father just passed away, and they're having visitation today and uh, the funeral tomorrow. So Donna's kind of been involved helping all that goes on getting that ready. So greetings from Donna and anybody else from our family, Garth, Renee, and Sri. <laughs> Hello. Uh, to see what God has done here, I just, I just amazed. I am amazed. I remember driving down here whenever and meeting with Herman um, and some other, a couple of other guys, and we were out in the corner, and this was still pretty much set up as... Uh, Automobile garage was it Chevy, GM, or or Ford, or Maserati, or I don't know, some kind of a garage, and how uh, you have worked and prayed and seen God transform this thing, and it makes me think of the pastor out visiting the farmer, and uh, they'd had a great meal, then they're walking around out, and the uh, the pastor not being much of a any background with farming said, oh, look and see what God has done. Rows of corn and wheat and soybeans. And the farmer said, yeah, you should have seen it when God had it. It was <laughs> cucklebur, sunflowers, weeds, <laughs> junk. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you happen to be at uh, City Church, I have to stop and think. Not MGT and not Lake City, but City Church. Uh a couple, three weeks ago, I was privileged to speak there. And I, I have on my heart the same message. So if you were here then, if you were there then, you get a double dose. So double barrel shotgun, this is the other barrel. So it's good to be here. I want to speak on the theme or the thought of generation to generation. And it's good to see people up here from uh, Grand Detour checking me out, see if I'm still saved. Um, <laughs> Dennis and Stan. <laughs> Generation to generation. And we'll come back to this, I think, at the ending. Um, every one of us needs three people in our lives. This is not original original with me, but I, I read it or heard it many decades back, and it stuck with me. Every one of us needs in our life someone that's beyond us spiritually, like an Apostle Paul. Every one of us needs someone that's alongside of us, pretty much, like a Barnabas. And every one of us needs someone that's younger in the faith or younger in age, like Timothy. Because if we have someone that's mentoring us, someone that's walking alongside of us, and someone that we're mentoring, it is a tremendous safeguard from turning away from God or giving up because these people are in our lives. Generation to generation. I remember I was... Young, and my mom and dad were talking about dad's birthday. He was going to be 40. And I thought, oh, he's going to die. He is old, 40. I won't have a dad much longer. Age is really relative, isn't it? Wow, it is really relative. Generation to generation. Every generation must experience regeneration or there'll be degeneration and ultimately <laughs> termination. Generation to generation. In the book of Psalms, I find this is both a mandate and a message and a motivation that that includes all of us, no matter what our age might be. Psalms chapter 71 and verse 17 and 18, or maybe a couple more. 78, or 71, I'm sorry, verse 17. 71, verse 17. Oh God... You have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, 
Oh God, do not forsake me until, until I declare your strength to this generation and declare your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, O oh God, who is like you. I believe there's a mandate there for me to speak into the lives of younger people. And I believe there's a mandate there for younger people to listen to those of us that are older. So there. <laughs> but there are qualifications, believe me. You know it, and I know it. I want to declare your wondrous deeds, your power, your glory, your might. There are so many verses along the line of, I've been young, now I'm old, but I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God is faithful. God is faithful, and he calls us to be faithful. And a lot of other verses, but I'll just let those rest at the moment. People that um, are smart, I guess, come up with all these little designations and groupings. So they say today we're in all these groups. Millennials, millennials born between 84 and 98. Some millennials here. Then Gen Xers are born between 1965 and 1983. And the boomers are born 1946 to 1964. And the elders are born before 1946. And us dinosaurs were born before that. I don't know what that means, but people do that, sociologists and so on. So we are in different groups of age categories, but we're all to be the people of God. Now, I find this as an admonition, and I want to heed this admonition that I will declare to this generation the power, the glory, the blessing, the touch of God. Because God wants to be in each and every one of our lives in a very positive way. God wants to have a part of our lives. So, I want to declare God's power and also His holiness. His goodness, and also His mercy, His forgiveness, and His grace, and all those attributes about God. So, I'm an oldster, a dinosaur. And it's my mandate to speak to you who are youngsters. Pastor Roger, you're a youngster, because you're a decade younger than me. <laughs> Wish I had ten years back, but it, you can't erase it, can you? So, how much... What differentiation or, or, or grouping would, would youngsters be? Well, to me, a youngster is anybody 20 years younger than me. And, and I keep shifting as years go by, who's the oldster? Anybody 20 years older than me. <laughs> it's funny how that's relative and how it changes. My uh, in-laws moved to retire in Madison from California. And my mother-in-law passed away six, seven, eight years ago. And then my father-in-law just passed away, I think, two summers ago. So Grandpa Peck, Garth Peck, was about 91 or two. And he had to go to the hospital, and then he had to go to a, uh, an assisted living for a little while. So he is in this assisted living there in Madison. Now, Shree, our daughter, is a counselor for hospice. So she's working and dealing with death and dying all the time and the grieving that goes with it. So one noon she had some free time, so she drove over to see Grandpa Peck. And she came in right at noontime, and uh, one of the aides brought in his food, a tray full of food, and put it on the little thing over the bed, and and uh, he leaves. And then uh, Sheree says, Well, Grandpa, the dining hall is just two doors down. Why aren't you down there eating with all the people? He said, Oh, honey. Oh, honey, I don't like old people. <laughs> And he's 91, 92. There are a lot of reasons why old people aren't liked. Let's face it. And especially in the Christian realm where we ought to be liked. But there are reasons why we're not liked. And I, I don't want to have those kind of parts and pieces and things in my life. Because I have a biblical mandate to speak into the lives of younger people about God. Well, it's pretty easy for me to know that young stirs won't listen to me if I'm a cranky oldster. If I'm critical. I came to church here this morning. Where's the organ? Thank God there's nobody in that cage over there. 
I would have walked out. And there's no hymnals. What in the world are these little ditties that we're singing? I've heard old people talk that way. Are they going to speak into the lives of the youngsters? No way. No way. No way. I am thrilled that our grandkids want to talk to us. Call us. We're in Southern California, Desert Hot Springs, and they're all in the Midwest. They want to come and see us, especially when it's zero here and it's 90 degrees out there. I don't have anything to do with it or not. Just this last week, Fourth of July weekend, one grandson was there, and we were going to get an errand somewhere, and he said, Grandpa, I want to talk to you. Okay. Grandma, what's your advice? I, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm uh, going to change cars. Should I buy a new one? Should I buy a used one? Or should I lease a car? We had a great discussion. Now, not all grandkids care to talk to their grandparents because they're either know-it-all or negative about all. I want to be an old fogey <laughs> that is still appreciated by my grandkids and other young people because I want to speak into people's lives of how great God is. God is still on the throne. Well, if I am critical, I've been looking the crowd over because especially men now, young men, wear these man buns. I don't know if it's artificial, like glue on, or if it's their hair. Shave the sides and then roll it up here like a top knot. And we can just be so critical. You know what? You know what? Who cares? When I went to Bible college down in Texas, the in thing then in the 50s for us guys was to have flat top and dovetail. Oh, we had hair along the side. Woo! And we got criticized. My dad liked to choked on it when he saw me. We can criticize things that really don't make any difference. And I'll get into deep water here, but your pastor can straighten you out later. Tattoos. Oh, I like your tats. Oh, and they'll smile if it's a young person and you're pushing 80. Oh, I like your tats. See you. That's far enough. You don't need to show me any body parts. Those things make a difference and how I am received by the younger generation that I need to speak into their lives about these great things of God. I, I've read the Bible through, I guess, Genesis to the maps for about 50 years. And now I have to be honest. When I become to the begats and the begats, I just go and then start over when I'm through. I've not ever gotten too many blessings out of all the he begat, he begat, he begat, who? But isn't that funny? Then all of a sudden a verse jumps out at you. And just a short while ago, I'm reading through Ecclesiastes. And this is a verse for those of us that are over 90 or 80 or 70 or 60, whatever. This is a great verse. I love it. NAS, Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 16. Do not be excessively righteous. <laughs> Or maybe we should say super spiritual. Super spiritual gags me. Maybe it's because I'm not very spiritual at all. It says, do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? <laughs> There's a verse in the book for every occasion, especially if you keep using different translations. You'll find one that's just perfect. But I want to I want to be able to speak into the lives of young people. I want to speak into the lives of those that are younger than me. This next week I have a birthday. Whew. Seventy nine. What happened? Where did it go, Glenn? Where did it go? <laughs> now <clears throat> I want young people today, maybe they already know, I want young people, anybody younger than me, in fact, to know that God is still on the throne and God is still working. Young people have every reason to ask what Gideon said in Judges chapter 6. Where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? You want me to serve God? Well, where's God? What do you see Him doing? Now, some of you are single, maybe want to get married. Most of us do. 
I started praying for a wife when I was nine. Don't laugh. I was very mature. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, my mother was saved and filled with the Spirit, healed of, of a heart attack when she should have died, and she was so on fire, and my dad just was like a Missouri mule, set his feet and wouldn't, wouldn't go with this. No way. So our otherwise good home was sad and bad and, and not good because Dad fought this. He didn't go to church. He didn't want anything to do with it. And I started thinking as a boy, if I get married, Lord, I want someone that we're just together in knowing you, in serving you. And God certainly answered that prayer. Now, if, if you're single and hoping to get married, pray. Pray. Not everyone gets married. I understand that. But by and large, by and large, most of us in the USA get married. And I just abhor the fact that divorce rate has gone really down, 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 because we don't get married. We just live together and split. So I also want to declare to this generation that God still is not for fornication and adultery. And as far as I can read the Bible, if we're committing those things, you ain't going up. You're going down when you come to the end. That seems harsh, but there's no other way I can understand this book. So with gentleness and love and, 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 and hope to share God's word to this younger generation, well, pray about the marriage situation if you hope to be married. I, I, I know today the world is a mess. Pastor just mentioned it, and boy, it is a mess. So you might think, should we not have children? Should we not have children? The world is going to hell in a hat basket. The morals are going down, down, down. The whole restroom issue, I don't even think it's a, a really a biblical issue. It's a stupid issue. I was going to check your restrooms and see. But, uh. <laughs> the world is a mess. The world is a mess. It's enough to make you negative and pessimistic. It's enough to make you throw up your hands. I, I, I sometimes quit watching the news for a while because it's just too bad. And the only thing that encourages me is watching the news about the political scene. Joking, 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 joking. We are to declare to the younger generation the glory and the power and the blessings of God. Well, do we have children? It's normal and natural. I can tell you, even though we've had a challenge with our three, they're all serving God. Some of you know Garth. He was a triple challenge. <laughs> so full of vinegar, we used to say when we were younger. God wants to help us with our children. God wants to help us with marriage. Get involved in this marriage seminar. Is that Eckridge? Yeah. Respect and all that good stuff. Avail yourself of every opportunity to strengthen your marriage and your, your relationship with one another. It's, it's, it's just so vital. Well, God is still working miracles. Some of you were a part of the, which church was it then? Madison Gospel Diagram? I think it was Lake City Church. When I came back from Liberia, they gave me up to die. Some kind of a fever. I couldn't, I, they didn't know what to do. And the days went by and the doctor finally told Donna, he's, he's going. The doctors, battery of doctors, we're losing him. We're losing him. We're losing him. And <clears throat> maybe you were in the church. Somebody stood up in the service and said, I have a word from God. Pastor Heckman's living in sin, and if he doesn't repent, he's going to die. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Good old Pastor Bernie Norland got up and said, that is not from God. That is not from God. And here I am, many years later, feeling pretty good. God is still doing the miracles, the miracles, the miracles. And those of you that know our family and our son Garth, he is like a cat of nine lives. He's on his eighth right now. I'm telling you to slow down because cancer and car accidents and, and things that he should be gone to heaven. God works miracles. He just had a big exam from his oncologist and he is five years cancer free. Glory to God. His oncologist told him we didn't think you'd be around. We thought you'd be leaving planet Earth a couple years ago. So I want to be able to declare to the youngsters that God is still alive. God is still working. And I may be a dinosaur, but God is still working in my life. 
And God wants to walk side by side with you all the days of your life. Because it's in the book, and it's true. Declare the power of God, His presence to people today. Psalm 71, verse 18. If you read other translations, it sometimes broadens or expands uh, a little bit more on it. I think it's the Living Bible translation. I want to clarify God's grace, God's power, God's love, forgiveness, mercy. It has not changed. And those of us that are older, we need to be demonstrating it when we speak of it. And if we are living the fruit of the Spirit, it is like a sledgehammer blow. If we're critical and cynical and pessimistic and negative, our words are not likely to even be heard. Through the years, I have encouraged parents raising children. Yes, it's hard. Raising children and and juniors turning away from God right now and the little missy is doing things she shouldn't do. But you know what? If mom and dad are living the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't take too many weeks, months, or years till our kids wake up and say, you know what? What I'm doing is hard. It's harsh. I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I have worry. I have condemnation. I feel sin. And, and mom and dad, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. They, they, they just exude it like fragrance. And that's really what I want. That's really what I want. And, and kids will turn from their stupidity and really truthfully come back to Jesus Christ. Come back to Him. All right. Declare His power. Declare His grace. Declare His mercy. Declare it. Ex- be an example of it. Like the Apostle Paul repeatedly in the epistle says, Be as I am. Do as I do. Imitate me. You know, That's a challenge. That's a challenge to me all my life. Could I say to someone, handle your finances the way I do? Got a credit card bill of four thousand on this credit card, six thousand on that credit card, and four thousand No, no. Can I say handle your finances the way I do? Let me show you. I remember going to the home apartment of a young couple and uh he was just head over heels in debt and about ready to lose everything and had a couple little kids and, and went in to sit down to try to help him. And he was just telling me how excited he was. Couldn't pay the rent, but he just bought a big, new, fangled Harley Davidson. Well, I like Harley Davidsons. But no wisdom when it comes to finances. Can I show them the way? Can I say... Make your marriage, pattern your marriage after my marriage. Come in and see how my wife and I interact. See how we fight. <laughs> Come and see how we work through things. Come and see how God has helped us. Come and see how we've had to humble ourselves and, and be willing to compromise. That's a good word in marriage. Be like we are. That, that's a challenge. No matter what area of life, Come and and, and be like we are on the job. We're faithful. We go in early. We stay late. We're the best help there can be. And the boss says, if I could just find a few more people like you. Yeah, yeah. I want to be able to speak that into the lives of people who are younger, maybe even people that are older. Probably not at this point, but... But I have to live it. I have to demonstrate it. I I have to display what God has done and what God is doing in my life, that I might fulfill this mandate from the Psalms. So my motivation is all in all of this is that, that others might enjoy what I've been blessed with. How many years have you been married, Pastor? 51. November, we celebrate 58. We met in 54. I had to chase off all the other suitors, and it took me four and a half years to drive them out threaten their lives, and then we got married. <laughs> That's a long time that she's put up with me. But I, I would like to be able to demonstrate to others, God is for you. God will help you. Will I listen? Will I yield? Will I follow this book? 
I remember years ago in Madison, a couple were having problems, and they asked if they could meet with me. And so we set up a meeting, and they came in, and we started talking. And I said something, well, the Bible says, he said, I don't care what the Bible says. I said, we're done. We're done. I'm not a professional counselor, but I can sure tell you what the Bible says. And if you follow what the Bible says, so they got up and left. And split. Well, these are just a few things I, I would like to share with the uh, youngsters that it says in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. It's great to serve God. Pleasures evermore. Joy. That doesn't say it's easy. No, life is not easy. But in him there is joy. Then, in Matthew 11, verse 28, <clears throat> Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The world doesn't offer much rest. Money doesn't bring rest. Position doesn't bring rest. All the things that we strive for in this world. But he does. God offers to us rest. And that he will take our heavy burdens and, and the yoke that's upon us. And his yoke is easy. Then, 1 John 1, verse 9. And these are just really quick. Each one could be a message. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Years ago, many, many, many years ago, when Roger was, was leading the youth at City Church, Lake City Church, MGT, the greatest youth group in the state, for some reason, he asked me to speak. And I spoke that evening on uh, forgiveness and how God wants to forgive us. God wants to forgive us. He promises to forgive us. He will forgive us. And I finished and was praying, and young teen person came up to me sobbing, sobbing, said, I, I need to hear that. I need to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven. I did this and this and this, and I, and I need to be forgiven. And we prayed, and she walked out floating on air. God forgives. <laughs> he does. Anybody here been forgiven? If not, you're going to hell. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you straighten him out next week, Pastor. Uh, but we have failed, some of us miserably. But in God's sight, maybe there's no difference. Failure is failure. Sin is sin. But He forgives us. I want that message from my life to just shine forth to younger people. Okay, you blew it. Yes, the sin was terrible. Repent. And like a ton of bricks in your backpack, it's taken away. Forgiveness. What a what a great message we have to share. Peace. John fourteen twenty seven. My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, but my peace, godly peace. The turmoil of life. It shows itself in our faces and our eyes and in the wrinkles. So if you have wrinkles, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Obviously you don't have peace. No, I'm just kidding. But it's a heavy load to to, to not be at peace. But God wants to give us peace so we can lay down, uh, put our head on the pillow and sleep. Sleep because he's given us peace. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. I, I, I would say, I would truthfully say that some of the news today scares me causes anxiety deep deep in my heart. As the pastor mentioned earlier, what in the world is happening? Where is our society going? Without God, we're going to hell in a handbasket. But we have God. But we have God. So I do sometimes just say, Let, let's just not even watch the news or read the paper because it's just a, it just seems to be nothing but bad news and worse bad news. Or we joke, worser and worser. <laughs> But God is still sovereign. And when I read through the Old Testament, which I still do over and over, he was in charge even when the king turned away from God. It ran its course, and finally it was bad enough they started to repent, and God came back and helped Israel. It's time for America to repent. It's time for Christians to lead the way. As it says, and if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven, and I'll heal the land. 
We have three great grandkids. And uh, I was staying out in the entry to uh, Dennis and Stan or somebody. Grandkids are awesome. But great grandkids are gooder. <laughs> and I see these little uh, one and a half year old, two year old, five year old, and I, I can't help but think, what is the world? that they're going to be growing up into. What is it? Well, then, as an oldster, I'm compelled to pray that we see a great awakening in our land, turning back to God. And and I think God wants to do that. And I think it's my opportunity and responsibility to be a part of the praying that will happen. So I mentioned in the beginning, and I'll close with this with a little bit of emphasis. Every one of us, I believe, call out a mentor, a coach, an advisor, a counselor, whatever. We need someone that's ahead of us, maybe spiritually. Maybe an age, maybe not an age, but they're ahead of us. And so we could say uh, someone like the Apostle Paul, that I look to, I listen to, hopefully I meet with, or nowadays with all the communication available, you know, I text back and forth. And, And they speak into my life. Their experience and their wisdom, their knowledge of God, And for some of us, we are that person to someone younger than us. So along with someone above us and beyond us, we need someone that's alongside of us, a Barnabas. A Barnabas, someone that's, you know, we're pretty much the same in our experience with God. And and we challenge each other and we love to share with each other and we're inspired by each other. And it helps us on our walk with God. We need that. And finally, we need someone younger or newer in the faith, like a Timothy. Because if I'm helping someone, counseling someone, ministering to someone, encouraging someone, boy, it, it makes me stay on, keep me on my toes. Makes makes me stay close to God because I'm trying to help and encourage this person that's younger and newer in the faith and I can't stumble. God, I can't. I've got to set the example for them. It's an amazing thing. I mentioned earlier, my dad was not a Christian. But when I was growing up, I I started working for a farmer. Our farm was small, and Dad didn't need my older brother or me, so I was actually 12 years old when I went room and board for a farmer. He was a Mennonite. He was a godly man. And through those years, he was like Apostle Paul to me. He knew God. He served God. He loved people. He helped neighbors. I'll never forget, one of the neighbors borrowed something, a harrow or a disc or something, and brought it back broken, never said a word. And Arnold said, oh, people. Never criticized him, never got on his case. He just fixed it and kept on with life. He mentored me what it was like to be a Christian in difficult times and good times and hard situations. And, and it so inspired me. That wasn't my dad. That wasn't my dad. He wasn't a Christian. So <clears throat> I'm working for him. I'm in the middle of summer. Then I'm 13. His equipment was big. And so I'm driving, I don't know, in a field about half mile rows. And I come to the end. This is either a big, big disc or a big, big herald. It's, I don't know, 15, 20 or more feet. And, and I come to the end and I go to turn and didn't realize that I didn't give myself enough space. Next thing I knew, I was tangled up in a four or five uh, barbed wire fence. I couldn't get out, couldn't go forward, didn't know what to do. And so I hiked back to the farmhouse. And I came in there thinking, Grab my stuff. I'm done. It's over. <laughs> I'm fired. Chokes me up. Arnold said, Warren, get in the pickup. Let me get some tools. We rattled down the road, uh, the field, came to the, the big equipment, t- tangled up. He said, okay, just a just tight, cut the wires, got the thing out, tighten the wires back up. <sighs> Slapped me on the back and said, you're doing good. My dad many times should have spanked us, but instead he cussed us. I mean, he could swear. And sometimes when he was really mad, he would goddamn us. That was painful. And this guy slaps me on the back. (laughs) You're doing good. I I think I worked for him every summer, five years in a row, until I felt called to go into ministry and went off to school. He, He mentored me. 
Well, I would say my Barnabas was my brother. A couple years older, we were as thick as thieves. <laughs> Did all kinds of things together, encouraged one another, helped one another, and, you know, spoke into each other's lives. He just died last January. Someone alongside of me. And I don't even know who I would say was Timothy because in ministry, you, you touch quite a few lives you speak into. But I would encourage you, if you don't have an Apostle Paul, someone older and more mature, find somebody. Not always easy. Find somebody. And if you don't have a booze and buddy that's right alongside with you, find somebody. And if you don't have someone you're pouring your life into, find somebody. Because it's a tremendous help in serving God. So that we might declare to this generation the glory and the power of God. He is still at work. He still wants to come into our life in a greater way than we've ever known. And be to us the God that we need. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we would realize from generation to generation we pass the baton. And you would have for us people that we can really touch if we look and listen and pray and allow you to speak into our lives. Someone we may never even think about, but it's someone we need to really be a friend to. And depending on our stage in life, help us to see someone that we need to draw near to and let them speak in our lives. Help us, Lord, to realize we should not try to go it alone. We need people. We need people around us that can speak into our lives and people that we can speak into their lives. Because, Lord, we want to make heaven our eternal home. Help us to be able to speak of of things that you're doing now. Not a hundred years ago in the days of the Bible times, but now you're at work. And we can say, look, do what I'm doing. Be what I am, like the Apostle Paul did. I pray your anointing, power, and blessing will continue upon Grace Church, upon Pastor and Sandra in their ministry and their leadership. Continue, O God, to make a huge difference in this community and beyond for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.